Hi, welcome to Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. We're going to be talking today to artist Paul Shapiro in his studio uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We're continuing our series of discussions with people in the arts from this uh, wonderful western state. As a native of Arizona, I certainly appreciate the Southwest, uh, but uh, and easily have uh, moved into New Mexico and during this visit and am enjoying the state and uh, Santa Fe immensely. Uh, Paul, uh, before we look at your work, um, you came from Boston, Massachusetts to uh, Santa Fe, what, about five years ago? Yeah, I moved here five years ago. What, what, uh, what, what uh, sent you here? Why, why, why did you come to Santa Fe? Well, from, I was uh, coming out here in the 70s on painting trips. And I knew the first time I came out here I wanted to live here. It's quite a beautiful place for me to work, totally uninterrupted. And it's very much in line with my vision. I can't imagine doing the work I'm doing living in a big city anymore, in this country, that is. Well, you're so tied into landscape. Paul is uh, extremely uh, successful and, and highly respected here in Santa Fe and in the Southwest and um, increasingly elsewhere. Um, Paul, I, I really struck that um, through your life as an artist that you you seem to have had uh, transcend, almost transcendental experiences that that uh, moments of revelation when you, when your own destiny has been revealed to you and your uh, maybe your your inner self has has revealed itself uh, and and I, I'd like to refer to one that that starts you off as an artist. Uh, you, you were apparently a biology major at Northeastern University, and you went to, what, the Boston School of, um, Museum School of Fine Arts to visit your friend, Arthur Yanoff? Yeah, that's true. And I walked into the school and saw basically paintings for the first time in my life. And I said, I can do this. I just knew that instant. And I went back to college and quit that day and became a painter. <laughs> How did something like that happen? I don't think I've ever had an experience like that. I mean, can you... There's I mean, no I, way to develop it, I guess. It was just this no, total I, immediate I had, reaction. Yeah, I had this experience of total alignment with what I was supposed to do in life. And I did it. You did it. Yeah, yeah well, that's, that's, uh, I, that has struck me as just a real, really uh, fantastic uh, uh, thing. Uh, Paul uh, is basically an expressionist uh, artist, and we'll get into that as we start to look at some of his work. and. And really, I uh, think we should look at the first uh, landscape that we have in mind, and I guess we're looking at it now, Paul. Um, can you tell me when that was executed, how old you were, and uh, so uh, forth? Well, this was done in 1974. It, it's a period when I started very seriously concentrating on landscape painting. I was living in New Hampshire, and almost all my landscapes at this period were done completely from imagination. So Without any references at all. So you're you're 35 years of age approximately at this this point, right? And this, uh, I mean, um, I'm well, I was born in 39. I'm, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm cribbing. <laughs> I'm cri looking at my notes, and they say you're 35. Mm -hmm. um, what 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 are you trying to express in a picture like that, and also in the one coming up? And uh, I, personally, I see a great uh, relationship to uh, a theme flowing through all of your work, whether it's early and late, and perhaps. Perhaps you can just tell me when, when you did this, where you were, and, and what you're trying to express Okay, this, th this second painting was done in 1982. And this was, I feel, a very strategic point in my development as a landscape painter. And this was done in Maine. I was staying on Mount Desert Island. And this is an actual place. I, I drove by it, and I saw this hovering cloud with this one lone pine, um, pine tree and this um, inlet form, and I just had this vision of this painting instantly. And I, I think it's an expression of the forces of nature all interacting. I'm absolutely not interested in expressing um, painting in any kind of realistic way. I look at it as much more in a metaphorical and symbolic way, and also in an expressive way. Let's let's look at the picture that's up, and then we'll think of the two that we've seen before. I, you know, I, personally, I see these as uh, very personal statements of uh, not only beautiful handling of aesthetics, but a uh, there seems to be a very symbolic, uh, profoundly psychological 
uh, themes involved in here. That they're, they all have water at the bottom. They all have uh, sort of a passageway to a form above it. You know, in the previous one, it was this inlet opening out to the cloud, almost as if, if it were a birth canal in a sense. The inlet we're giving birth to it here, the, the mountain or the cliff face rises out of the water. In the earlier one, there was the first one, there was water below and then the opening between the two mountains almost, uh, which I think was a very uh, sensual image. I, I think this is very, uh, uh, not sensual, but very almost anatomical in a sense, but very, I, I, I feel that you're really uh, saying something very profound. Perhaps there's no way to be specific about it, about your own uh, orientation toward life and your own inner sense of balance and conflicts and struggles. Do you mm. do, do you want to carry the ball? Yeah, well, bas basically, it, you seem to in be implying there's some sort of sexual connotation in these forms that I'm using. Consciously, I do not do this, but a lot of people have been seeing this. And if you look at Chinese painting, you'll notice is that it's always about male and female forms interacting. Mm -hmm. you know, that's what Taoist painting is. One of the aspects of it. And the landscape is about that. And I don't see how I cannot help but use these right, things. Right, exactly. They're, they're there. Right. And forms either go in or out. Right. And, and I, actually, I'm not thinking so much of sexual. Maybe I, I overemphasized it, but sort of basic uh, components of the, uh, the, the psyche somehow. That I, I don't know whether water can be interpreted strictly in your pictures as being sort of the unconscious, and it, it comes up against... Uh, uh, you know, some outside force. Uh, but uh, I, if we go back to that very late modern, uh, uh, the, the very latest uh, landscape that we're talking about, it's going to be coming yeah, up this here. One, this one here, yes. It was done very recently in this summer also on Mount Desert Island in Maine. And it, it's a series I, I'm working on I call the Dark Sea series. And basically, I feel I'm re I've really been simplifying the form and abstracting it. And the, the, this whole new series I'm doing is quite different than earlier work. Um, but what are you getting at? In, well, in this ju just that, it, 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 to me, it's, it's uh, obviously a development aesthetically. The, the shapes are more two-dimensional and reinforcing each other in a, perhaps a more geometric, more, more simplified form, but we still have the sense of the foreground water between two uh, gate-like, gateway-like peaks in the entrance. Then you have the three floating forms, you know, islands perhaps in the middle of the Black Sea, and then you have mm -hmm. the mountain uh, facade and the clouds rising behind it. I, I think, and also it makes a face, which uh, is going to be we'll be seeing in some some later pieces. But okay, if we look at this figurative piece here. Uh, uh, many people may think your figures and your landscapes are quite different, and, and I want to get your uh, feeling about what you're expressing in this particular piece, but also it strikes me that we're having two opposite forms, one above the other, the way the water was below the rocks. Here we have the luminous female below this very dark male. I mean, it seems like you're trying to combine sort of two... Uh, symbolic elements together. It seems like you're working in pairs, is, I guess is what I'm saying, that, that it, you're ending up in some kind of attempted expressive union in a sense, kind of a symbolic union. Well, again, it's that Taoist concept of yin-yang, which is something I'm kind of involved with. And, and, and a lot of this, uh, these notions really come out subconsciously. Oh, yeah. I, I never really set out to do these things in a very conscious manner. I, I really don't believe in doing that. Yeah, well, I, I don't either. I think the greatest artists work from the unconscious, and then if you, uh, not that the mind isn't present, but it can start functioning and becoming more analytical after the uh, mm -hmm. work is, is completed. So w what are you expressing in these dark figures then? We have this one with the dark figure above, and then beyond and above it is this kind of uh, ghost-like spirit orange figure, and beneath it again is the, in this instance, a cat and a, and a fish. Is mm -hmm. there a particular feeling you're trying to express? I well, mean, can you th this painting I call the benefactor. And there's this kind of strange African-looking figure in the background hovering around this black figure, which is hovering around this cat and fish. 
and in a sense, maybe I'm trying to convey some sense of harmony, some harmonious existence mm. together. But beyond that, I cannot read into my paintings. These okay. images just appear. Okay. I don't know where they come from. Okay. And sometimes I, I will start my images by doing some mono prints, and that will set a whole chain of series to to go into the future with you know to build that you yeah, build to, your yeah, paintings to build from sure right. Okay, so we're, we're looking at this picture with the, again, the, the opening through the cliffs uh, and the two female figures almost uh, miraculously revealed in, uh, in again, almost, uh, as I would see it, a very symbolic contrast of the soft flesh and, and the dark, I mean, not the dark in this instance, but the very rough, hard stone. It's mm -hmm. like the sea, the females are the sea and the cliffs are the masculine. It's almost like these two elements are are coming together in your work, as you've said several times, from the Taoists. And, and notice uh, in the upper right-hand corner that kind of penetrating dark cloud that, yeah, exactly. that's kind of coming into the sky in the upper right corner, if you can see that. Yes. Uh, one thing else that, that strikes me about these pictures is that they they have often what I what I use a term called the, the, the vista, uh, kind of opening out onto a vista or as we'll see in some of your other pictures, well, here's another opening in a sense, the foreground water and the channel again where the two figures were seen before. Here it's a waterfall compressed and contained within mm -hmm. these two enveloping uh, cliff bluffs. Uh, in a lot of your pictures, I, I feel like there's a strong aspirational element, uh, often culminating, if not in a cloud, then in a mountain. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've thought of, say, Cezanne's uh, Mount San Victor pictures, in, in, that, in a symbolic sense, but it's always seemed to me that those mountains rising at the top are kind of symbols of eternal solidity, something you can depend on, some kind of aspirational quest for the gods, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, Did that, you that, feel that? In sure, your... I, I've looked at those paintings and I've studied them over the years, and I have thought about them quite a bit, actually, because one, one of the main things in those paintings is the compression of space as though this mountain is on a stage set. Right. It's something I'm very involved with in my paintings, and that's the compression of space to, you know, accentuate the two-dimensional aspect of painting. I have absolutely no interest in realism or rendering in a three-dimensional manner. And it's, it's, a, it's a very prime concern of mine, this compression of space, because I, I feel I can create all kinds of dynamic forces that, that work in a much more powerful way in, in, in the picture plane, rather than having atmosphere that just flies softens, back into the background. Softens everything. See, see I personally don't like most landscape painting. Right. I feel right. it consists of a horizon line, and you can just add on and on and on to, these, um, to this canvas. Exactly. And, um, and with, with no dynamics, with no concern for the, the vertical edges. Or you mean the, na can, the nature, the actual shape of the canvas? Yeah, the, the and picture so forth. plane, sure. Right, exactly. Um, you're very, uh, I, I want to talk to you about some of your revel further revelatory experiences in just one moment and, and why you may feel that some of the artists that you admire as well as your own personal needs in, as an artist. But uh, I, I'd like to look at these two pictures here uh, and just uh, compare and contrast them for a moment. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful landscape, uh, you know, which, which goes without saying. You know, what's you know, interesting very... about this landscape is I started it in the summer of 82 in Maine and finished it in New Mexico oh. when I had moved here. So yeah. it has combinations of both elements. Oh. If, can we pull back on that a little bit? Because what, what's, what, one point that I want to make in terms of kind of the, the unity of Paul Shapiro's work, whether it's a landscape or a still life, some of the same themes, some of the same inner feelings are being explored. If you really think about this, obviously there's not only the, the gateway opening through the valley, the river, between the trees to the distant mountains and the two clouds, um, the sense of the quest perhaps in a sense for some distant goal, but if you look at those two clouds, they're really almost like eyes. And if you begin to think of the, the shape enclosed by the trees on the left and the trees on the right, you have really kind of a face shape that ends in a rather pointed chin. Now, if you go, if we go to the next picture, an actual portrait, uh, I believe you call the conductor. Mm -hmm. uh, really, we have that same shape in the face that you have expressed uh, unconsciously, I'm sure, uh, in the landscape. So that uh, the point I'm trying to make, and I may be way off base, and you, you'll have your own comments about it, is that 
that Paul Shapiro is really a very strongly interdirected artist of you know, great power and those inner feelings and forces, whatever they are, are uh, being continually expressed in in your work, you know, and in, in a very unified, expressive way. Do, do you feel that? Yeah. Way well, I it? feel like the, the what you just pointed out is perhaps a matrix that I've superimposed on those two paintings. And as far as the specifics of it, I know, to me that's not so important sometimes. Where you get that. Um, landscape of the opening where you see two eyes in the clouds and then you get the portrait I did called the conductor right and it, it, I, I think that matrix is superimposed on each other and it's coming from probably some third area in me that has nothing to do with those two paintings. with, with either yeah, one yeah. of them yeah okay um, now you, you have you have this uh, natural uh, expressionist bent and uh, when you were at the age of 20, you executed your first expressionist woodcuts, and we'll take a look at one in just a moment. But um, you also, a year later, uh, you met uh, Jan Cox, uh, who was the chairman of the painting department, I guess, at the Museum School mm -hmm. of Fine Arts, and, and you record, you're recorded as being deeply affected by his paintings. What, what, yeah. what was this deep effect that they had on you? Well, Jan was a very original painter. He was also very obsessed with mythology, especially the Iliad by Homer and also Orpheus and Eurydice. He spent years working on series of, of both those myths. His paintings had an incredible inner quality to it, and they were totally his own. And somehow there were seeds of a, a very strong kind of energy in these paintings that could affect the viewer if they were open to it, mm -hmm. beyond the subject matter even. And, and he really understood this a lot. See, his paintings were kind of out of sync with the times. During this time, abstract expressionism was very much in vogue. Um, fortunately, he's no, he's no longer with us, but fortunately he's coming to his own in Belgium and is very highly recognized. Mm. And they're doing a major film on him. Oh, they are? Right now, yeah. And then this great book came out on his work. So it was just this uh, and, and kind could, of visionary spirit. Yeah, yeah. That, and you uh, couldn't categorize his paintings. Right. It didn't look like anyone else's. Right. It was very personalized. Um, when you were 23, uh, you began a close working uh, relationship with David Barbero, Howard Schaefer, and Herman Di Giovanno. Uh, I get the sense that that, that is another strong link in your development. Can you kind of capsulize yeah. that for us? Or? Well, Herman D. Giovanna was considerably older than us. He um, was probably around 60 years old when I met him. And he was another visionary. Um, his paintings came from another world. There's absolutely nothing you could relate these paintings to. They're totally his own vision. And having this kind of um, camaraderie with Herman and my other two friends, we all worked in a certain realm, which was the realm of the inner. Mm -hmm. And a mm -hmm. lot of us were also very affected by the work of Odeon Redon. Right. There seemed to have been that spirit in Boston back in those days. We're and talking I, the early 60s. Then, yeah, and, and I'm very fortunate to have been around that, because I, I think it really um, prepared me for something. Yeah. Well, if we, we talk about that spirit of innerness, uh, that is certainly one of Paul's uh, major features and very strong features in his work. And if we look at the uh, painting on the screen, um, it, it really expresses that quality in a very dark, moody um, spirit. And I'll let you yeah, carry th on. This is a way. small landscape I did in Crete. It was, it's one of the um, first ones I've actually did that survived. And it also reminds me of what was to become of me in New Mexico, a very similar kind of depiction of the landscape. And uh, would you tell us why so few of them survived from Crete? Well, basically what happened is um, I went to Paris in 1970 and saw this expressionist show at the Museum of Modern Art, and it was mind-boggling. It was one of the greatest shows I've ever seen in my life. It had everyone in it, from Edvard Munch, Kirshner, Kandinsky, Chagall, and so forth. Van Gogh and sure. so forth? Sure, yeah, everybody. Yeah. And it had a lot of paintings that I had never seen reproduced before. I walked into the show and had this incredible experience of, this is what you're about, Shapiro. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that 
For so many years I was doing abstract paintings and they weren't really coming from choice. They were coming from, let's say, lack of skill. You know? And, and, and I, I think I, I was really considering what the art world was doing. I was very affected by de Kooning at a certain earlier mm -hmm. period and so forth. After seeing that show, I left for Crete and decided to start all over again. And how one does this, I don't know, but I did it. I started painting directly from nature, and it was very difficult. Oh. And I, I spent six months in Crete and did these landscapes and developed a new identity. I went back to Paris and ended up throwing all these paintings in the Seine River, a very romantic gesture, of course. But, but. <laughs> I, I couldn't take my new identity yeah. as a landscape painter yeah. because it was so out of sync with the times. Mm. But as soon as I got back to Boston, which was about a month later, I did go back to figurative painting and, and really confronted this issue. Well, I, I uh, <clears throat> think it was a tremendously gutty thing to do to, I mean, to try to remake yourself and go against the, the fashionable and very dominating oh. currents of the time and to have to find out pull out something from your guts is it's a terrifying thing to well, have to Well, the, the truth is, do. Don, that I really had no choice in the matter. I mean, all these major decisions I've ever made, there was no choice. It's all gut level it's need. It's all and the way it should be yeah, for me. Yeah. Know, and, 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 and it's, you know, it's difficult, but there's no alternative. You know. Well, that, that's how I see you, because I, I see you as, as uh, you know, being driven by this deeper uh, creative need or demon or, you know, however one would uh, characterize it. And we should say that Paul was 31 at that, that time, and uh, that's a pretty... Uh, tough age to have mm -hmm. to make the rediscovery. Mm -hmm. So, so if we look at these, uh, this portrait here. Yeah, th this portrait I call portrait of an artist in the shadow of the Sphinx, or with the shadow of the Sphinx. In other words, he has a shadow of the Sphinx, and uh, it's kind of a painting where, where I was trying to create the mystery of the artist. And uh, I had the good fortune to have Jack Nicholson, the actor, by this. Painting. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, well, he's a, he's a great actor to have him. Great collector too. Is he? <laughs> yeah, as long as he. Oh, he has Picasso. Oh, Matisse does he too? Well. Oh, sure, he's uh, a major collector. Uh, well, it's nice to have someone like that to appreciate your work. And and one of the points I want to make about that portrait in relation to that first uh, moody landscape that you were talking about that you'd painted in Crete is the the dark power in both of them. You know, the dark, dark spirit really kind of unifies both the landscape. But see, I, I hope people don't interpret this dark spirit as something negative. Oh, no, no, not at all. See, I think it's... See, uh, see, I look at it as the, almost the germinal creative force. Oh, you know? yeah, absolutely. That, see, that, see, that's what, what I would What say. I want to bring up is in this piece right now, this woodcut, if we could see a whole view of this, this was done in 1959. I had probably been an artist or a student anyway about a year, a little over a year. And I'm most fortunate to have saved this because it really shows my roots. I, I was very attracted to German Expressionism immediately. And I really felt I had that impulse in me, that same Im impulse that they worked with. I, I feel that it really comes out in this piece. Oh, yeah. you know, and I was a 20-year-old kid in this. Yeah, and I did this. Yeah, I was living in New York and going to the Art Students League. Yeah, I, I really feel that you're operating, you're expressing in your time and for your time and facing some of the same uh, difficult world problems of how an individual survives in a world, you know, that has great pressures put on them and uh, very remarkably expressing it. And the, the spirit is, is very in mm. keeping with theirs. T tell us about this. Well, this is an portrait. early piece from 71 when I started painting mm. those portraits we had earlier talked about. I call this ancestor self-portrait, some sort of a spiritual ancestor that was me and them. Sort of root, a roots, your version of roots, I mean, in a oh, sense, we you could think, say looking that. for sure. your... Sure. Um, you spent a whole year painting self-portraits at that time, mm -hmm. Could, and this is one of them, as you say. Can you yeah. tell me why, why, why self-portraits and why, why such a concentrated... In, well, in this was the period when I got back from Crete. Crete. Yeah. I didn't know what else to do. I, I had this new identity as a figurative painter, and I really was kind of embarrassed to maybe have models. I didn't want anyone to see what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I was beginning again. And, so personal and private. Yeah, and, and I wanted to keep it that way for a while. 
The because it, it wasn't easy. Believe oh, me. Oh no, yeah. I I've been through it myself. I, I know that when an artist is giving birth, there's nothing harder. And I, did you remember the th uh, statement Van Gogh made in one of his letters that he disappeared from sight? Nobody in family saw him for about six months, and he likened it like to like a bird being in molt and. And you didn't want to be in public during something like that. You know, yeah. so it's difficult I mean, transition. Yeah, it's very important to do that for, for the urinus. Yeah. And, and see, so here's a more recent portrait, which was done last year, called The Prince. Also, Jack Nicholson owns this one. Oh. <laughs> how, how many of yours does he Just own? Just the, those These two, two? That we, we talked about. And this is a period where I started getting influenced by African sculpture. I started collecting African sculpture. And I remember the first pieces I brought home, I didn't, couldn't sleep for five nights. I felt that these entities had totally been absorbed by me. Oh, my God. And they, it started coming out in my work. Sort of like the spirits and, of the pieces? Yeah, and, and one of the things I started realizing is that we've been totally brainwashed by the Greek and Roman sense of form. And how, how powerful these other sense of forms are. You know, it's a whole other sensibility, which I feel are much more powerful because they deal with the real deep inner spirit, you know? Exactly. And a spirit that seems to speak to us in our time. Uh, we're coming to the end of the first part of a two-part interview with Paul Shapiro from his Santa Fe, New Mexico studio. And if we keep in mind some of the, the differences and similarities between all of, all of his work, and particularly the last two portraits, even though the earlier one done when he was 31, searching out his personal destiny, uh, is, more re is more realistic. Uh, there's this strong sense of form and pattern and design strength that becomes the major feature along with emotional expression in, in his later work. Uh, this is Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. We'll see you next week. Thank Thanks you. a lot.